All right, if you could now at this point turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter 41. Isaiah is a little more than halfway through the Bible. We're going to read in a moment the first 20 verses. Um, but as you're turning, I wanted to just start out with an account of a great feat that happened some 165 years ago um, up in Niagara Falls. Um, this was a stunning feat made by a man named Charles Blondin. The summer of 1859, put up a tightrope and walked 160 feet above the falls. If you've been there, you know these falls are very high, and, well, if you fall, it's going to be death. Um, huge crowds gathered on both sides, the U.S. and Canada, as he walked back and forth across the falls on a tightrope. Once he crossed in a sack, once on stilts, another time on a bicycle. He even carried a stove and cooked an omelet. Um, I suppose this is one of those George Foreman types, not like your range in your kitchen, I'm just guessing. But on July 15th of that summer, he walked backward across the tightrope into Canada and returned pushing a wheelbarrow. And it's told that after pushing the wheelbarrow across while blindfolded, that he asked for some audience participation. And the crowds who had been in awe, um, he asked them. He had proven that he could do this. That, there was no doubt of that. But now he was asking for a volunteer to get into the wheelbarrow and take a ride across the falls with him. And it, it is said that he asked his audience, do you believe I can carry a person across in this wheelbarrow? And of course, the crowd shouted, yes, they believed. But then he posed this question, who will get in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> and of course, no one did. Right? So a similar question comes to us today as it pertains to God. Do we believe things about him? Or do we trust in him? So please listen as the living God addresses us through his holy, inerrant, authoritative word. Isaiah 41, 1 through 20. Listen to me in silence, O coastlands. Let the peoples renew their strength. Let them approach. Let them speak. Let us draw together near for judgment. Who stirred up one from the east, whom victory meets at every step? He gives up nations before him, so that he tramples kings underfoot. He makes them like dust with his sword, like driven stubble with his bow. He pursues them and passes on safely by paths his feet have not trod. Who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. The coastlands have seen and are afraid. The ends of the earth tremble. They have drawn near and come. Everyone says to his neighbor and says to his brother, be strong. The craftsman strengthens the goldsmith, and he who smooths with the hammer, him who strikes with the anvil, saying of the soldering, it is good. And they strengthen it with nails so that it cannot be moved. But you, O Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend. You whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all who are incensed against you shall be put to shame and confounded. Those who strive against you shall be as nothing and shall perish. You shall seek those who contend with you, but you shall not find them. For those who war against you shall be as nothing at all. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. Fear not, you worm, Jacob, you men of Israel. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I make of you a threshing sledge, new, sharp, and having teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and crush them. You shall make the hills like chaff. You shall winnow them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the tempest shall scatter them. And you shall rejoice in the Lord, in the Holy One of Israel, you shall glory. When the poor and needy seek water and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. 
I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights, and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dried land springs of water. I will put in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, and the olive. I will set in the desert the cypress, the plain, and the pine together, that they may see and know, may consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. May God bless the preaching of his word. Well, as we look at this text together, I have three points taken from the text to help us through it. Three points. First, God's word to the nations. Then God's word to his people. And finally, the transforming power of God's word. So before we start into those points, though, just a real quick background and occasion of this writing. So from the beginning, when God had created all things, he made them in perfection and very good. But man soon determined that they wanted to be their own God, create their own way, and they sinned against their maker. And the first couple, though Adam and Eve sinned, God mercifully did not end them or end humanity. Instead, he chose a people out of the world through whom he would work in the world to redeem, to save, and bring back to him. He chose the man Abraham, and through Abraham's offspring, God's people Israel, his plan was to unfold. However, at this time in history, the people of God were following in the steps of Adam in rebellion against him. The year is around 700 B.C., some 2,700 years ago, and here God uses his prophet Isaiah to confront his people in Isaiah's own generation with their repeated failure to treat God as if he really was God. As such, God had brought them into judgment and he sent them off into exile into Babylon. This great, powerful empire and nation had defeated and captured, captured God's people and took them into slavery. And here, where we pick it up in Isaiah 41, God's prophet is speaking to his people, the people of Abraham, but they are now in exile. They're enslaved. And they're living in very difficult and terrible circumstances. And so here we see, starting in verse 1, verses 1 through 7, first point, God's word to the nations. So what God is doing here, he's calling the peoples and the nations to listen to him. He calls them all, even those far off from the coastlands, like maybe along the Mediterranean Sea there. He's calling them together for judgment, the text says. But note here that God is not bringing judgment upon them. He's calling them into a courtroom, as it were, with him. Let us present the evidence together. God says, you make your case, and I'll make mine, and there will be a judgment decided. So as God presents his evidence here, he presents his evidence first, we see a statement in verse 2. Isaiah, Isaiah speaks of one that is stirred up from the east, who is victorious at every step, and it reads a little funny here in English. It says, he gives up nations before him. And so the he in this verse is clearly God. And most scholars would agree that the him before whom God is giving up nations who will trample kings underfoot, this is a prophecy given by God of future events of an earthly king yet to arise on the earth, a king from the east, King Cyrus of Persia. More than 150 years, around 150 years before he was even born, Isaiah calls him by name. In a few chapters, in chapter 45, it says this, this is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him. This is a startling prophecy. By name, a future king who would reign and rule and, and uproot the nations before him. This is clearly evidencing God's sovereign power over all nations, God says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he will accomplish all that I please. And so although this audience of Isaiah did not know him, we know of him, Cyrus the Great, ruler of the Persian or Archimenid Empire, if I'm saying that correctly, stretching from the Middle East to Europe and into Africa, and that by him God would cause his people to be freed from slavery and return to their homeland. 
Then you see in verse 2, there's a question. Who stirred up this one from the east? Well, it's answered in verse 4. I, the Lord, the first and the last, I am he. He's telling his people that he is the one stirring up history. It's not a mere prediction. It's not like, well, God sees the future. No, he caused it. He has been in control from the first, and he will be to the last. He will raise up another king to conquer their current Babylonian captors. His rise to power will be no fluke, no accident. And so God has made his case. He's saying destruction is coming by an earthly king. And make no mistake, it will be God who will do this. He will cause it to be. So then we see the case made by these uh, pagan Gentile nations um, that God has called together in the courtroom. God declares his sovereignty, and what's their, what's their response? Well, there seems to be fear, but what they do is they tell one another to be strong. Let's prepare ourselves against this king and against this God. And they, their goldsmith and their craftsmen make more idols. They're bigger, strengthened by their own hands, hoping that their gods will protect and defend them against this king and against Yahweh, God. They do not submit to God, but they fortify and prop up their idols. So this is their answer when God says, let's draw near for judgment. They think they will not be moved. They will stand against God with their gods. And so that is their response and their case made after God has made him. So now we move on to point two. Now God's word goes to his people in verses eight to 10. So you can see this transition clearly in verse eight. It says, but you. God now is speaking to different people. These are his people who, as we've heard now, have enemies. They are captive of a Babylonian empire, powerless, hopeless, and enslaved people. But God has not forgotten them. Even then, he is working in this process of raising up a pagan king to do his purposes. These were God's people. They were chosen by him. He pulled them out from among these other nations. He chose Abraham, the one from whom they came. He was a man just like any other. He was taken from the far corners of the earth, the text says, not some special place. He was special because God chose him. And God chose them. And this is why his people can have confidence. So what's their response going to be? God presented this same evidence to his people. Uh, should it be different than those of the pagan nations? Should they attempt to somehow fortify themselves? Should they fear that God will bring further judgment on them or punish them? Well, they know this, and God has reminded them, they are his chosen people. He has not cast them off. He has called them friends, and he tells them what their response should be. Fear not. The idea of fear here in the Hebrew apparently is fearing as if someone is just constantly looking around like where's trouble going to come from uh, what's next I, something bad is going to happen there's danger around me but god tells them don't fear and why should they not fear he says for i am with you not just i will be with you i am with you be not dismayed well why should they not be discouraged and distressed he says for i am your god not a worthless idol made of wood, powerless, but the author of history. I am your God. And what does God say he intends to do for them? He says, I will strengthen you. He will give them courage and resolve when they're afraid. I will help you. I will, he will give mercy and grace. He says, I will uphold you. I will lift you up when you're weak, when you're failing, and when you're falling. And he will do it all with his righteous right hand now this is not to say that god has hands um, he is spirit uh, but if had he had hands he would not be using his left hand or his off hand now if you want to get an idea of what this might mean after church today if you'd like to come over to our backyard we can throw the football around and i'll try to throw with my left hand and uh, it's not going to be very good you're going to have to move a little bit closer to me <laughs> it's going to be a little uncoordinated but if I use my right hand, my dominant hand, I, I can do okay. It's not going to be really impressive, but, but I can do okay. And so God is using his right hand to signify the instrument by which, of power by which he accomplishes all his justice, his right, and good purposes in the world. 
and also his dominant or right hand as we would to draw near those he loves. So armed with the revelation that God has provided to his people, he's promised he will be with them. What is this going to look like? What is their future going to look like? How will it unfold? Third point, the transforming of power of God's word. Verses 11 through 20. So these truths that he's telling them about who he is, that he will uphold them, he will strengthen them, they're not theoretical. They're not just to gain book knowledge. They're meant to change the lives of the hearer. They should think differently about their enemy because God is with them and he will defeat their enemies. In verses 13 and 14, God, in case they didn't get it the first time, reminds them again, fear not. He will make them, though, as it says, Jacob a worm. Interesting term, right? A worm? Well, really? Should we think of people that way? I mean, why is God calling them a worm? Won't that hurt their self-esteem? Um, shouldn't they be looking at their innate goodness and their self-worth? No. Only when they realize they are weak will they be strong. The worm symbolizes one who is helplessly inferior to the task. That's a pretty good image, isn't it? What can a worm do? Helplessly inferior to the task. But God says he will make them into a new threshing sledge, a new one with sharp teeth. These sledges were large boards that they would use with sharp stones and metal blades affixed, which they would uh, beat and drag over grains to separate the edible part from the stalk or straw. In extremely important. They had to live to get food. They would use these sledges to separate the grain from the straw. Incredibly useful. What a transformation, right, from a helpless worm and it's not just that they're going to be threshing grain. God says they will be used by God to, to thresh, not wheat, but mountains and hills. A move of God that will bring upheaval throughout the earth. As we know today, all these ancient enemies of his people were Israel, the kingdoms of Babylon, the Persians, the Syrians, Philistines, Canaanites, they're gone from the earth. But God's people are still here. He's using them as an instrument to accomplish his will. And his word has now been taken to the ends of the earth by his people. Here, a worm will remove mountains. God will scatter and defeat enemies before them. And, you, and he would return his people to their promised land. But that's not the ultimate purpose of God here. We, we continue to see in this text more clearly what is coming beyond the near term for his readers but in the far term and what has come for us today Ray Ortland puts it this way Isaiah is not talking about Christian political power taking over he's talking about the gospel of human weakness triumphing over opposition and our timid faith overcoming the world and in his strength alone our privilege is to thresh into smithereens every obstacle to rejoicing in the Lord. That's our job. Let's get on with it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we read in the New Testament, later in God's revelation in 1 John, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who, it is, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This faith is not like the faith that so many peddlers of lies claim today that if you have true faith, you can manifest things to happen out of yourself. No, this is faith in God, the one who manifests things and who controls all of history. We see it come into more focus even in this text where God brings water where there is none. He provides water in these verses for the poor and needy. He will bring it to them and provide it in places that no one would expect. Do you see that? He's bringing rivers on bare heights. In the wilderness, the desert, what does he bring? It, he brings a pool of water. Dry lands will spring forth with water. He will provide and satisfy. This is in Israel's 
future, and this is our present reality and future as well. But, now wait a minute. Can we be sure? I mean, we're making a transition here from these promises of God in the Old Testament to today. Can we know that these things apply to us? Can you be certain that God has called you as friend? That he will uphold you with his righteous right hand? Well, we see an echo again from afar from these folks to the New Testament. John 7, we read this. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. In the near term, God is overthrowing enemies for his people, returning them to the land, giving them water to quench them. But we're pointed in the long term to one who will quench the thirst of his people forever. And more. What's the name given in the text here of God himself? He says the Holy One of Israel. It's mentioned three times. It's none other than God incarnate. And this is Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of John, Simon Peter answered Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. In the Gospel of Mark, even the demons know it. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. God had promised this Messiah, the Holy One, would come. And his righteous right hand is moving to make that happen because he would come from the promised land, from Israel. He will get his people back there because the Messiah is going to come from that land. But even in thinking of this, the Holy One of God, the Holy God, we, we have a problem. Because God is holy, he's perfect and pure, and we are other than him. He alone is righteous, he alone is true, he is just. He will by no means let the guilty go unpunished, and we are sinners through and through. We have no place with the holy God. How could he say to people, I'll uphold you with his holy, righteous right hand? How could you and I have any grounds for thinking, oh yeah, he, he's my God, he will, he will help me. When, when by all rights, we should only be judged by his righteous right hand. How can the unholy have anything to do with the holy? Do we have these promises? Can we claim them? How could it be? Here's how, my friends. Listen closely, here is why. Because God took his righteous right hand. The implement by which he enacts all his holy and right and good purposes. He took his righteous right hand and he put it down. He put it down on his one and only son. His perfect, obedient, willing son. And he crushed him. He was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. By his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, he has not simply told us about This is not philosophizing, wishful thinking, promises that hang on nothing. God has invited us into the courtroom, and he presented evidence. He demonstrated his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We have beheld it. What more can he say than to you he has said? And now, all the justice of the righteous right hand of God and his wrath for sin has been spent on Jesus, who then rose, and there's nothing of that left for us. Only his love from his righteous right hand to bring us near and his promises, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. 
I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. This is why we must have Jesus. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other sinless one who could do it but the Holy One of God himself, Jesus Christ. The just for the unjust to bring us to God. And this is open to anyone. Open to all, but it is not accepted by everyone. Listen, everyone here is going to have to deal with the righteous right hand of God. If you today have not confessed your sinfulness before a holy God, your disobedience to him, and confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and that he died in your place on that cross, and believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then the righteous right hand of God is still against you. My friend, and you are in grave danger. I plead with you, look at the evidence he has given. He died for you. Don't resist. Put your faith in the Holy One of Israel, Jesus Christ. Don't prop up your false gods. Don't try to build them up. Well, I, I'm, I'm pretty good. I think I'll be okay on my, my own righteousness, my own goodness. I've done more good than bad. I, I'm here in church today. Doesn't that count towards something? No, don't prop them up. Put your faith in Christ Jesus alone. But if you have confessed and believed, then God's hand is only and fully reaching out to you in love. There is no more anger or judgment or penalty left. It will only and always ever reach for you, for you in love. And listen to this, John chapter 10. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Brothers and sisters, God has you in his righteous right hand. Who do you think could remove you if he says you will never be removed? This is why we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Ray Ortland again says this, God longs for us to draw strength from his greatness. Do you see here how he lingers over his commitments to his people? He chose us. He called us. He's committed to us. People who have a sense of that in their hearts are unstoppable. You know, a number of years ago, I guess it may be 20 years ago now, my wife Colleen and I um, had a little change in life. Um, when we were first married, we had made a decision that I think we would have try for three, three children. We, we each had three in our family, two siblings, and seemed like a good plan to us. So maybe we could handle it. You know, three doesn't seem like that many. Um, <clears throat> but then in the course of time, we became persuaded and convinced by God's word that they're a wonderful blessing from God and he desires children. And so we had faith for it, and we decided we wanted to try for more children. But one issue at that point, we were... Um, you might say, a bit advanced in years and beyond what, we, what would be considered uh, the normal season of growing a family. I must say that I'm always a little more advanced in years than my wife. She reminds me of that often. <laughs> uh, but as I pondered these things, I began to hear of, I just seemed to hear and read things about the greater dangers of childbirth um, in advanced age for the health of the mother, the health of the child, my wife also decided she'd like a home birth. That's another reason for me to be fearful, potentially. Um, and so I began waking up at night with all these what-if thoughts. Like I would said earlier, I'm looking around. This could happen. That danger's coming. What if? What if? Then I recall a conversation, and I don't remember much about it. I don't know who it was. I think it was a woman, I think, from the church that I was talking with and sharing some of these thoughts of mine. And I was speaking of my worries, and she said something very simple, something like, well, no matter what, no matter what, your child will be beautiful, made in the image of God. And my heart sank in me. Because I realized at that moment, of course, she's absolutely right. All people are made in God's image, will exist eternally, equal in dignity and value. But more than that, I realized underneath that I was not trusting God. Because it went beyond mere concern or wise preparation. And it doesn't mean 
that if I had faith, none of those things that I fear would ever happen. No, I just wasn't believing in his promises. For when he told me, fear not, I didn't believe him. He told me, I will strengthen you. I was saying, mm, I'm not sure you will. And he said, I will help you. I will uphold you. I did not think that his righteous right hand would be strong enough for me. So the wonderful good news to weak sinners is that at our moment of weakness, lacking trust is in God, just as with his people in this text, and as with you, he graciously does not abandon. He didn't abandon me. He didn't punish me. Even though I didn't have faith in him, he remains faithful. He cannot change. He is faithful. And so when our troubles, uh, consequences of our own sinful choices even come our way, he's not casting us off. You may feel weak today that you have failed to put your trust in him. Maybe you feel like, I don't know that I've ever I got in a wheelbarrow. I don't f know that I really believe that I'm in the righteous hand of Christ. Hear these words from Charles Spurgeon. He says, now Christian, I see you this morning ready to run away from the battle. You have been so dispirited this last week through many adverse circumstances that you are ready to give up your religion. Brother, do not let us play deserters after all. Let us up to arms and still fight for our master. For the promise says, I will help you. Brother, what an all-sufficient promise that is. I will help you. Why, it matters not what God has given us to do. If he helps us, we can do it. Give me God to help me, and I will split the world in halves and sliver it till it should be smaller than the dust of the threshing floor. Yes, and if God is with me, this breath could blow whole worlds about as a child blows a bubble. There's no telling what a man can do when God is with him. So as all these things are happening, he directs and intends and promises that even when it looks most grim, don't be afraid. He is with you. He will one day put an end to all troubles and trials. But until that day, he is with you. Well, many of you are familiar with the famous Tolkien uh, novel, Lord of the Rings, and I'm going to share an illustration from it. There's many Wonderful, I find, illustrations there. And I know there's some Tolkien geeks here. I'm not going to maybe get all the details right, but bear with me, okay? I'm going to try my best. I find this helpful. My, one of my favorites is there's a battle over the capital city of men, Gondor. Uh, it's called Minas Tirith. And they're under siege. They're being attacked and beaten back by these evil, foul creatures, orcs, hateful, fearful. From behind the battlefield charges other men, Rohirrim, their horsemen, led by their king, and they... They begin to sweep through the enemy, defeating them. And as they begin to feel the battle turning in their favor, however, they hear the sound of trumpets and turn to see a long row of a new enemy approach, a giant row of giant, humongous elephants equipped for battle with long, deadly spikes attached to their tusks, dozens of archers riding on them into battle. It's just like a fearful and seemingly unbeatable foe. But then this is what happened. The king, in battle with them, calls out loudly to his men, reform the lines, rally to me, and take them head on. Those powerful enemies, like for us, so many lies of the devil, so many allurements to love this present world, so many temptations to sin, so many troubles, trials, they come at us. They can keep coming at us. Some like it, sometimes it may feel like it's an endless stream that they may never end. But this is God's word to us, as it was to them. Rally to our God. Rally to Christ. He is with us in the battle. He holds you in his righteous right hand. You see, he has chosen you and set his love on you. He crushed his only son for you. He will scatter and defeat all enemies before his chosen ones. And in the final verse of this text, we see God's intention that they may see and know 
may consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created us. So do not succumb to discouragement. Do not be dismayed nor fear. He is your God. He is with you. He will strengthen you, help you, and uphold you. And after all this is done, eternal life with him awaits. Amen.